You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey, vet rehabbers. Welcome to the Veterinary Rehabilitation Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Megan Kelly, and today we are going to be revisiting one of our Facebook Lives that we did in the Hydro Vet Rehabbers group. Now, this is a Facebook group. It's free to everyone in the community if you're qualified as a hydrotherapist or studying to be a hydrotherapist or a vet rehabber. Um, we have two other ones too, a small animal vet rehabbers and an equine vet rehabbers for those of you that are interested. And um, We have a great community of vet rehabbers in all three of these groups, helping one another, sharing cases, asking questions. So hop over onto Facebook and just request to join. Um, We'll just check to see whether you're qualified. And if you are, then you are welcome to join in on the conversations that are happening online. So this particular Facebook Live was with one of the leading vet rehab vets in South Africa, Tanya Grantham. She has a practice called the Animal Health and Hydro. We have had her on the podcast uh, a few times before, and um, we chat about the challenges of geriatric patients in hydrotherapy. So over to Tanya. And I've got my colleague, Tanya Grantham. Um, she's also here in South Africa. You can see she's outside. Um, when, I, <laughs> when I saw her come online, I thought, oh, that looks so nice. Have you got a T-shirt on? Isn't it winter? <laughs> it's winter, but you know, the high felt days are lovely. It's just the mornings that are cold. I know. I remember when I studied, you know, I, I studied in Pretoria and um, it was freezing. I remember like coming from Durban, it was just, oh. it was the coldest place I'd ever been. And I remember even having all these thermals, which I never owned a thermal once in my life when I lived in Durban. And um, but the, the middle of the day, you'd have all these layers, and then you'd slowly just start taking all the layers out. And then I just yep. remember lying in the sun in breaks um, and lunch lunch breaks between lectures. It was fabulous, and always blue skies, aren't they? Yep. No, no rain on the high felt in the in the winter. It's lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, our geriatric patients, they, they make up a large portion of, of our patients. And now, obviously, we're talking more sort of for the hydrotherapist now. Um, but sometimes they can be a real challenge for hydrotherapists, can't they? Yeah, I think they, they certainly can. Um, particularly, they often have more than one condition or one problem. Uh, there's always a lot of um, human emotion around the older dogs. There's been they've been loyal, there's been lots of love. So, you know, there's that aspect that we have to deal with. Um, and then, you know, for me also, if if we have an older dog that hasn't yet been exposed to water from a hydrotherapy perspective, that also creates another little hiccup, you know, in, in the treatment regimen that we might choose um, for the dog. Yeah, I mean, just talking about that emotional component, you know, I mean, some of those those dogs have been with their owners for 14, 15 years. Yeah. Um, and, and and I tell you, one of the things that, that I really used to struggle with is that, you know, we knew what they needed to do. So we knew, we knew that we needed to do hydrotherapy, therapeutic exercises. But often from the owner's side, they were hesitant to push them because they were older or hesitant to do some of the, 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 the things that we wanted them to do because they just thought, yeah. oh, well, they're old. And there's always this sort of thing, well, that's just old age, isn't it? That's that's yeah. how they should be. Do you yeah. find that in, with, with your clients? Um, I, I find probably more the opposite. I find that a lot of the dogs that I see, the really oldies, are incredibly compromised. So to ask them to do specific exercises or really um, cardiovascularly challenged, challenging um, therapy session often for me would be contraindicated and yet I've got the client who wants to hang on to the dog's youth who's going but of course my dog can do it so for me it's often it was often the opposite in terms of no no um, I'm going to push and push and push and I'm going hey let's take a step back um, let's be respectful let's imagine this is your 85 year old grandmother Um, would you be asking her to actually swim you know, a 50 meter Olympic length in the pool, you wouldn't be. And so there's always a conversation about what's appropriate, um, what following on my examination, what I think the dog can can manage. 
um, and then finding the middle road in terms of what can, what is, uh, what would be suitable for that particular patient, but at the same time fulfill the needs of the client. So there is always a balance. So I think we basically have two types of clients. We have one that just says, well, that dog is, my dog is just old and that's just, I'm just going to yeah. accept it. And then we have those other ones that, like you say, just want to hang on to their youth. Um, and yeah. that's one of the challenges that we have. So it's not just the challenge of dealing with the geriatric patient. We're dealing with the owners yeah. and, um, and, and the outcomes that they're wanting. Yeah. When you're looking at hydrotherapy, Tanya, um, you know, in my experience, I, really, I had an underwater treadmill. I didn't have a pool um, at my practice. Mm. Uh, but I really liked the underwater treadmill because I felt like I had a lot of more control. And, um, you know, I had other, other cases that I would often refer to hydrotherapy. But, you know, in my opinion, I think that the underwater treadmill has a lot more control. You can stop the underwater treadmill a lot quicker if there's a problem. You can easily feel the dog's pulse just to see what its yep. heart rate is doing, monitor its breathing. For, for you, I mean, I don't think there's a there's no right or wrong answer with this. Um, for those really old geriatric patients, do you have a preference or is it dependent on the case? No, look, you know, for me, everything is dependent on the case. So, you know, it. but let's let's look at a couple of scenarios. Let's say I have a golden retriever. He's had a history of, he loves water. He's very comfortable in the water. Um, he's overweight, he's arthritic, um, there's no other medical issues. His heart is good, um, he doesn't have any thyroid issues, so there's no metabolic diseases. You know, that dog, I'm, it's highly likely I'm going to put him in the pool because that's where he's comfortable. And obviously, it's also a, um, those dogs, even at age 14, are often really active. I want to move, let me move. And sometimes by putting them in the underwater treadmill, we f I find that they end up getting frustrated. And then that frustrates the owner. Okay, so that's one. Okay, it is an extreme. We don't always see that. If I've got a dog, let's say, for example, I've got a little Yorkshire Terrier, also 14 or 15. Um, it's a tiny dog. It's a little bit anxious. It's never been exposed to water. Those are the dogs that I'm going to put into the more controlled environment. Um, so the treadmill then is lovely. Or um, I'm in the process of looking at um, investing in a, in a spa with jets. That's probably where I would start them off because it's warmer. It's, uh, they don't have to do anything. They can sit on my lap. Um, we, can, we can make a gentle, there can be a gentle massage in the water. And so we slowly introduce them because a lot of those dogs may have a heart murmur. And so we've also got to really be aware we don't want to, number one, create a high level of anxiety. And number two, we also don't want to push them from a cardiovascular perspective. So to answer your question, it really is case dependent. Um, and sometimes even like now, I might have an old dog that's really arthritic. I may choose to really just what I call float them in the underwater treadmill. So just so that we're using the buoyancy and we're allowing the muscles um, to relax. They don't have to hold themselves up. The water is supporting them. Um, and we allow some release of the muscles and some relief on the joints. So sometimes I even just do that for a short period of time. And I find the dogs really, they really love it. Yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's something in humans, isn't there? Like those flotation tanks where people mm. just go and float in yeah. water. I, I, I don't know too much about the human thing, but I love the idea of the spa. And, you know, the, the hydrotherapy center down the road from my practice they had a spa and um, I had a little doggy with elbow dysplasia who used to go for hydrotherapy there and Mia and she loved the spa. She absolutely yeah. loved it. Um, she was a little bit um, anxious in the pool, but the spa, she was so comfortable. She would sit on the therapist's lap and get her massage. And yeah. so I'm um, mm. Tanya, looking at geriatric patients, obviously pain is a big problem because a lot of them have multiple issues. How do you, I mean, obviously as a vet, you're able to, to manage um, their pain by prescribing medications um, and doing other treatments. But for the hydrotherapists, can you give them any tips on, on how to be aware, you know, when you're swimming and doing underwater treadmill um, of these geriatric patients' pain um, and, and how, how they're actually 
are coping with it, you know? So mm -hmm. ideas of, of things to look out for if there is worsening in the pain. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, that's a, a, a very good and valid question. So first of all, I want to know, how is that dog moving on the land? Where have I got compromise? Um, obviously, I will have got a vet report. So let's say we've got bilateral hip dysplasia and we've got some spondylosis. I'm going to have an idea and a picture. I'm going to know this is how the dog walks in the land, on land. I'm going to put the dog, that dog probably initially would go into the underwater treadmill. And if it's comfortable enough to walk, then I'm going to look at, okay, how is this dog moving in comparison to how it's walking? So I'm going to have a picture of how it's walking normally. Then I'm going to build up a picture of how it's walking in the treadmill. I'm also going to have a baseline pulse and I'm going to be able to monitor the pulse reaction. And from a behavioral perspective also, we want to look at avoidance behaviors. We want to look at behaviors and calming signals, which are also indicating to us, maybe the dog is going into pain. So sometimes it can be difficult to distinguish between I'm just not comfortable in the water versus I'm actually painful. And that's where I think a lot of gait changes can occur and a lot of weight shifting um, which would indicate more, look, this is painful as opposed to, um, I just don't like the water. Um, one of the things that I really like to do with those dogs also before putting them in the water, if they'll allow it, is to do a very quick myofascial release or a massage so that I've got an idea where are the tender points. And, and if I loosen them, I should actually get an improved movement within the underwater treadmill. So all of these things, I'm, you know, it's, it, I'm building up a picture. I have an expectation. If the dog doesn't meet my expectation, okay, what am I looking at? Is he anxious? Is he sore? Um, is the water level not at the right level? Um, so or I'm asking all of these questions all the time, depending on what the dog is giving me. And obviously, well, not obviously, for me, my owner is always with me in a, in a consultation or in a session. So I'm also able to really, I pick on them a lot in terms of their knowledge of their own dog. So I ask them, okay, so I think that this dog is now sore. What is your, you know, no, you know the dog. What is it that you are seeing? Please, can you give me some insight? Yeah, and, and I think the idea of the base baseline pulse is so important because mm. If you don't know what's normal for that dog, if the dog comes in and the owner says, I'm not really sure what's wrong with him. He's just a little bit slower today. He just hasn't been that excited for the last few days about his walk. Then you're in this position where you're trying to work out now, is it pain um, that's causing it? What is, what's actually going on? And if you have a, you know, maybe he's developed a, a cardiac condition, you know, mm. as they get older they're susceptible these, to these kind of things and so you have to be aware of this and make sure then you don't go then put the dog into the pool and there's actually yeah. something more going on or maybe the dog's sick for that matter yeah. you know so I mean I always I mean we would always have a thermometer in the practice to take a temperature of a dog like that check it, it always have a baseline so that everything is normal in that regard and then you can start to work out okay well, the dog's temperature is normal. The pulse is the same as it normally is. His breathing looks good. His color is good. Um, let's have a look now at the gait and have a look at possibly that this is a pain. Um, there's a pain thing. Maybe the dog slipped. And like you say, get that history um, yeah. from the client. But it really is for you to actually work all this out. So yeah. when when the dog comes into your clinic, and especially these geriatric patients, because it could be anything with them yeah um you need, to, you need to go through this process and actually have a system for when a dog is off color you know the owner says no they're not exactly right you go through a system of checks to make mm -hmm. sure that you don't swim a dog that's either sick or just starting to present with maybe some cardiac um symptoms yeah yeah no that's exactly exactly right and i also find so if the client will come in and say oh you know we've had a a very subdued last few days the temperature is important, the pulse is important, and you don't have to be a vet to be able to determine those. No. Um, but I also find, okay, did you do anything different? Have you actually given him his meds on time? Has he had his, you know, ha is, has anything changed in your regime, your normal day-to-day -day regime that could also be affecting him? Because if the dog hasn't had his anti-inflammatory, 
for two days because they've been on you know they've been on a business trip that's also something that you can pick up if you ask a, a, a specific question or a series of questions yeah definitely a change in in their routine um yeah. Tanya, uh, another topic i want to discuss because sometimes you know obviously if there is um the, maybe that there's a team of people, maybe the vet then refers to a rehab therapist and there's a whole sort of consultation looking at environment and medications and things like that. Um, yeah. Looking at the, the pets' um, environment, where they live, what the property looks like might be covered. But for the canine hygiene therapist, they might just come straight to them from a vet um, and they might have not have seen a, a vet rehab therapist. Um, let's chat a little bit about some things that the canine hygiene therapist um, can offer with regards to advice in adapting the home environment for these geriatric patients. Great. Megan, I'm going to run out of battery power. So if you lose me, I'll be up in about a minute or so. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Um, and there I go. Oh, dear. Okay, guys, um, so yeah, she's left me solo here. Um, I'm going to carry on with this thread. I'm just talking about um, the environmental things. Um, so, you know, one of the things that in nowadays, if you look at um, people's houses, they very, very rarely have carpets. Um, well, I know definitely here in, in South Africa, um, we have a lot of tiles, a lot of laminate floors, a lot of wooden floors. And the problem is this, with this is that it causes slipping. And especially in our geriatric patients who are very weak, um, especially in the hind limbs, they tend to slip. And um, we, we can chat about different, what, I, what I'd like to do is chat about different ways in which we can prevent them from slipping on these floors. And this is advice that you guys can give um, to your clients. So when you're doing your treatments, there are times sometimes where you have a little break, maybe the dog's having a rest. You can then have a little chat with the clients and ask them, so what's your house like? What kind of floors have you got? And if they say they've got wooden or tile floors, ask them, is your dog slipping there? And um, there are things that you can do, and especially where the dogs eat, we want to make sure that there is a mat where they're standing because if their front feet are slipping the whole time and they're spraying, it's really difficult for them to try and keep their feet together, to try and eat there. So having a mat, especially where the dog eats, really, really helps. You can also raise the food bowl and the water bowl. That helps them. Um, other things you can do is have runner mats. You'll find older dogs, and um, they tend to go from rug to rug. So if there's a rug, they'll go onto the rug and then onto the next rug, and that's because they've got a better footing there. And um, there are also quite a lot of products um, that you can use. Um, so those of you guys that know about the little toe grips, um, it's um, – Dr. Busby's toe grips. They're small little rubber things that slip on the nails. And this actually increases the grip zone. Um, so there's an area basically on the, on, on the uh, nail which actually grips onto the floor. And there are two places on the, the, the paw where actually the, um, where, the where, where they get grip. And um, so part of it's the nail and part of it's the paw pad. So what you want to do basically is either increase the grip zone on the nail or something on the paw. So there are lots of products. Another one is paw friction, which is like a rubberized type of, oh, there's Tanya's back. Hey, Tanya. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. No worries. <laughs> they don't um, make computer batteries like they used to. It was full um, when I started. Sorry. Um, no problem. I, I just started. I just carried on with the thread of what we were talking about, and I'm talking mm -hmm. about um, – different coverings on the paws, we were talking about slippery floors. Um, yes. So I just chatted about the toe grips and now I'm talking about that paw friction, that like rubberized um, yep. stuff that you put on the paws. I've, I've actually um, had a sample of that and I used that on my um, little dog, Charlie, and it really, really, really helped him. He didn't like the little toe grips. Uh, he didn't like the sticky paws, which are those rubber socks that you can actually put on. You can't leave those on for long. So maximum of 12 hours but you, the dog must be moving otherwise they can cause um um, um decreased blood flow um, yeah. so you've got to be careful with those um shorter periods are, are obviously better um, and then obviously also there's also boots like small booty coverings i'm not so fond of those in the geriatric patients i don't know what you feel tanya but i find that they're quite cumbersome they're quite mm. difficult to move in and they alter the dog's break over um mm. as they walk um, what, what is your preference so for do for people that have got slippery floors what would you be your recommendation yeah I think we you know I, I would agree with you with the boots I think that a lot of those dogs um, also have some difficulty with flexion 
And so now you're adding something onto their paw, which is going to change their gait even more. So I find that a lot of those dogs don't cope well at all with a real boot. Um, yeah. So I ask a lot of questions about the home environment and say, you know, I prefer to say, can you use rubber mats? Can you put on carpets? Can you change the home environment without changing the dog necessarily? Yeah. Um, the poor friction stuff I've, I've had clients use with good results. The toe grips um, in South Africa don't seem to last as long. And I think it's because a lot of our dogs are outside. Um, yeah. Whereas perhaps in North America and Europe, um, the dogs are more indoors and therefore they do get the wear out of them. The dogs that take to them, the clients report that they do really well. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's more for me about, okay, what adaptations can you actually make in your home that would assist the dog? And in some cases, it's even um, using the slings and the supports to um, get the dog up and move it around um, get it outside, for example. So the the abdominal, the whole body, full body harnesses, and even the the abdominal slings and the pick me up harnesses and those kinds of things, um, because a lot of the dogs are not hugely active anyway. So it's more about the management of the dog in the home environment as well, because they're not prancing around the kitchen on the slippery floors a lot. So yeah, that's usually. I ask lots of questions about it and see if we can come up with a solution that fits that family and that home. Yeah, I mean, that, that's one of the big benefits of being mobile, if you're in a mobile clinic, because you end up going yeah. to their home to be able to see those. But for you guys as Ken and Hyde, you can ask all these questions. Um, so another question to ask is, are there any stairs? Are there any split mm. levels? Um, there are lots of things that you can do. You can put ramps up. You can actually mm. just get um, condensed foam and actually just make a triangle and stick that in the stairs. Um, mm. So basically like a triangle of foam and you actually double side tape that and stick those on the stairs and make a small thin ramp at the side. I've done that a few um, times with um, patients of mine and they can get their nails in and grip in that condensed foam um, to help them um, get up. But the harnesses help often just with if you've got a big flight of stairs where it's not mm. possible to put a ramp up you can obviously use a harness just to get them up and down um, that area yeah what other challenges are there any other challenges with geriatric patients you want to chat about tanya um yeah i think the you know the next challenge that comes up is you've treated the dog for a while and you've given its improved quality of life and you've managed the pain and eventually you're going to get to the point where it's coming to the time where you have to say goodbye um, and that is a very big challenge so from a, from a hydrotherapist perspective if you're seeing that dog on a regular basis and it could be as frequently as once a week or once every two weeks and you start to see the decline um, in the in the movement and even in the perhaps in the mental capacity um, often the owners are in denial and i feel very strongly that for all of us that are in a therapeutic role we need to be the ones that alert the the owners to the fact that oh you know have you noticed this are you seeing that because often they won't see it or they don't want to see it and so you the, it's a big challenge to enter into that conversation about you know we've really we've tried this we've done this we've used you know, I'm getting to the end of my toolbox now. Um, yeah. And it's tough. It's tough to, to, to broach that subject. Um, but I really feel very strongly that we are custodians of that animal's wealth, health as well. Not wealth, health, health as well. So we need to be also looking out for the dog, like we have done and like we do, and say, look, I'm really concerned. Um, and let's enter into this conversation as a preparation. I'm not saying that you make the decision when it's time to, to say goodbye, but we are very afraid to enter into those conversations about end of life because we ourselves have so much emotion and so much pain associated with them, with that. Um, but if we start entering into that conversation, everybody gets a chance to prepare and the dog as well. 
And there's lots and lots of avenues to investigate around that, which is probably another whole topic on its own. You know, um, as can a hydrotherapist and vet rehab therapist, I mean, we've got so much to deal with. We're really dealing with the patients. And then we have the sort of psychological part and, you know, the emotional part that we have to deal with with our clients. And, you mm. know, a lot of us are, are very emotional type of people. And we're, we're in this um, profession because of the, the love and passion for animals and for helping animals and people. Um, mm. So I must say it was the one part of 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 being a vet therapist and being a vet that I used to really struggle with. Um, but a, a tip that I that I can advise to you guys is when you get an old geriatric dog that comes in, this this time is gonna come, right? And one of the things that I used to do is I used to ask the clients to tell me what the quali what is quality of life for their pet. Mm -hmm. um, and you can ask this as soon as they come in, the very first time or the second consult, and you write those down. And then later on, a year later, or when things start to deteriorate and when you have exhausted everything that you can do and you know, right, this, there's not, more, not much more I can do um, for this patient. And as Tanya says, you know, you start to have to point this out now. Have you noticed that to the client? You can remind them, say, you know, this is what you said to me. You know, are the things that is quality of life for your dog? Ask yourself now, what is the score? How many of those things does your dog have? And, you know, in the beginning, when I first asked them, I would say to them that your dog has to have at least three out of those five. So give me five. And a dog has to have three of those. If it's got less than three of them, then, then you know, it's not worth um, carrying on. And so you remind them of that. And that really used to help me um, mm. with that conversation because it, was, it came from them. You know, yeah. unfortunately, when you ask them at that time, then their mind has shifted as to what is quality of life because quality of life is now where they are at now, what's important to that dog then. But you, you have to go back to when, when they first came to you because that was when their life was a little bit better, you know, and that deterioration, they'll start to change their mindset, say, well, actually, it's okay if my dog just lies down all day and I have to carry it out to wee and, you know, they what what's acceptable to them changes. Um, so yeah. this is the tip. I don't know if you do that, Tanya. Yeah, I use quality of life questionnaires, which pretty much give me a score. And obviously, it, it has an interpretation. And so we'll do that in the beginning and then, you know, how, however long later we'll do it again and we'll look at how that scores change. So it's pretty much what you're doing. And if the, if the score rises, then the quality of life is decreasing. So, you know, it, it is asking those questions about what, what is of value for you um, and then having a record of it so you can, you can see the changes. Um, and sometimes we, you know, I mean, we're fortunate enough to have that score decrease, you know, in the first, you know, when we start working with the dogs and they start to respond um, and we start to manage their pain and they, their muscle tone improves and then all of those really positive things, you redo that quality of life, you'll see the number has decreased, which means that you, you have contributed hugely to the quality of life of that dog. So it, it, it moves both ways. Yeah. <clears throat> Tanya, what about, let's just chat a little bit about um, those geriatric patients that have more than one condition. Um, mm. So, and how, how, how we manage those, you know, especially like if I think about um, swimming and underwater treadmill, um, if you have a dog, say, that's got really bad elbow dysplasia, it's got hip dysplasia, it's had cruciates, um, how do you manage those ones? You know, what are the challenges of dogs with multiple conditions? Because the geriatric patient often does. Mm. Are you talking about multiple um, joint conditions? or It could have multiple joint conditions. It could have other yeah. health issues. I mean, yeah. you know, could, in, the, in the geriatric patients, we're often dealing with a lot of a lot mm. of things. On. They could be a systemic condition too. Yeah. Okay. So I think the way for me to approach that, and I'm going to almost try to put myself in the shoes of a hydrotherapist, because as a vet, I can obviously prioritize those things and then know what I can do and what I can't do within those limitations. But I think the first important thing is to say to the client, what is important for you? 
What do you need to see? So let's say they need to be able to walk that dog for half an hour every day. And currently the dog can walk maybe 10 minutes. And the dog has, so it has joint issues and it has a, um, a heart condition. Or it's overweight. So let's just say it has a heart condition. You need to be able to recognize that there are parts of that expectation and that request that perhaps are not going to happen. Because if the client has an of a dog like that, it's, it's unlikely you're going to reach that point. So you need to discuss what is feasible. It is feasible for me to turn up the muscles a little because I, I'm a hydrotherapist and it's a really good way of improving movement. It's a good way of releasing joints, but I'm restricted by the fact that I can't do a big cardiovascular workout because of the heart. So it's about prioritizing and I always use the client's request um, or I definitely take into consideration what's bothering the client. What does the owner want? to help me to determine where am I going to focus and how am I going to achieve what they want? And is that desire even realistic? Yeah, I think that's great advice, managing expectations. Um, mm. because, because of those multiple conditions, things change <laughs> um, and things are very different. Tanya, thank you so much. Um, I, the, our community has been really quiet. It's very unusual for the, the canine hydrotherapists. Um, they're yeah. usually the ones that chat, chat, chat all the time and make comments and questions. But guys, those of you that are listening to this as a recording, um, please fire away, um, post your questions. I will try and answer them or get Tanya to come online and answer them. Um, Tanya, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to come and share all your knowledge um, with the canine hydrotherapy community. Um, it's been wonderful chatting to you, and I guess that you've got a uh, waiting room still full of clients okay. to see. So I better let you know. <laughs> thank you so much, and cheers, canine hydrotherapists. Um, we'll see you online again next month. Yeah, and thank you. Sorry about the break, but thank you. No very worries. Much. Uh, I thank handled it. Oh, somebody <laughs> just said um, they love your haircuts. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I, say, I really, really liked it. It looks yeah. very funky. Um, yeah, cool. it makes you, not that you ever looked old, it makes you look younger, though. Um, <laughs> thank you. I'll oh, preface well. that with something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Great. Cheers, guys. Have an awesome Bye. day. Bye-bye. Vet Rehabbers. For more information on how to take your career to the next level, go to www.onlinepetalt.com. Please don't forget to subscribe to my podcast so you'll get notified. I'm here every single week talking to vet rehabbers from all over the world, learning, and I would love you to join me. Hope you have an awesome day further. Cheers for now.